Welcome, Robert. It's a pleasure to be with you. To start, can you introduce yourself for French public who maybe don't know who you are? In France, I have published uh, two books of mine have been published that got a lot of attention, but not recently. The last one was La Boule Verte. That book said that the transition to into renewable energy from fossil fuels and nuclear would not be gradual, but it would move in an enormous wave of activity after a crisis moment provoked the change. That was published in 2007, end of 2006. So far, the crisis moment hasn't provoked the change until now. Before that, I got a fair amount of attention in intellectual circles in France with a book titled Les Péchés Capitaux de la Haute Technologie. It looked at what goes wrong on grand, big, high-tech projects. That's why Le Monde now refers to me as an expert on technology. What I found was that there is very bad scientific documentation on how things work well. There's almost no real evidence that you can defend in court on how things work well. But there is a spectacular amount of information, real documentation on how things break, on how things don't work well, on how organizations fall apart on how people do dishonest things. And based on that, I was able to do a couple of books on science fraud and technology fraud and isolate certain practices that are common in failed projects. The, uh, uh, one of the reasons it was noted in uh, uh, several publications at the time that the French nuclear program, I'm against nuclear, Personally, I think it's a really bad idea. But there is no question the French nuclear program has worked and it's worked well. And the reason that it has worked well is it has avoided all of the bad practices that I enumerated in Les Péchés Capitaux de la Haute Technologie. So if I understand well, you are for the nuclear if the use of it is good? No. I'm against nuclear no matter what, but for other reasons. But one has to admit the truth. The truth is that the French nuclear program has not had a Fukushima or Chernobyl type event. There, isn't, there hasn't even been a major leak uh, that, that we are aware of, of radiation from any of the reactors. The system has worked well. The controls are good so far in, in the French nuclear system. So why uh, are you against the nuclear energy? Because it's dangerous? It's dangerous. It's the most expensive possible energy system you can have. Uh, we know it, when it was built, it wasn't. When it was built, money-wise, it was a good idea. But Renewable energy has become so much cheaper in the re intervening years that you can build the equivalent in gigawatts in solar. You can build eight times as many gigawatts in solar as you can in nuclear for the same amount of money. And you have no risk of a Chernobyl explosion. You have energy independence, which you do not have with nuclear because you have to import the fuel from someplace, and, and that someplace has been Russia and some places in Africa, and you have to do something with the spent fuel and reprocess it, do something, store it. Huge expense. Danger that nobody has ever really figured, and for a longer time than any civilization has actually ever lasted. And do you think that this is possible in, in, in this tense geopolitical context 
to go to the renewable energy, whereas many countries need uh, gas, need the Russian gas, uh, like European countries. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's possible for several reasons. First of all, Germany, for example, had, was using 55% Russian gas. 55%. So was uh, similar percentages in other countries, uh, high percentages in other countries that are down to zero. Germany's down to zero. Poland is down to effectively zero. So is the Czech Republic. So is Bulgaria. Here's a country that's not down to close to zero. Austria. They were at 80% Russian gas, and now they're down after a year of Russian war crimes in Ukraine. They're down, they're continuing to trade with the enemy, and, and they're down to 60%. 60%. Why? Because top officials in Austria are very close to Mr. Putin. If they had the political will that the Germans had, they'd be out of Russian gas today. Those other countries are out of Russian gas today, essentially. Okay, but Germany may have left Russian gas, but today uh, they use a lot of coal. Yes, they, they ran to what they could get right away. Not, in my opinion, the best way to do it, but that's what they did. I, in, I had an article in Le Monde that advocated yes. a much faster, cheaper, and uh, better approach, which was to have an emergency program of authorizing on land wind farms, not at sea, although at sea is great, but they take longer and they cost double, but on land even more than double than what on land wind farms cost. And photovoltaic, massive photovoltaic installations. Photo, a photovoltaic uh, park can be set up literally, literally in two weeks. The stuff is manufactured over here in a factory, you truck it in and you slap it down, the only question is connecting it to the electricity and getting the permission of some government authority that pretends there isn't a military emergency. But uh, so they haven't been giving the permission fast enough. That was an issue in the Repower Europe program when uh, discussed to speed up permission. The uh, uh, wind turbines, on land wind turbines, a wind, big wind farm, can be set up in six months. The, now, the cost of those two, they are the cheapest source of new energy, on land wind and solar, the cheapest source. And they are, I don't know, a quarter, of the, I, I don't have the exact figure, but for imported natural gas, which is roughly four times the price it is in the United States, on land wind and solar, are much cheaper. So it could be done faster and cheaper, and it's already being done. Here's what happened in Europe. The European Commission wanted to speed up the uh, authorization of uh, solar parks. That took a lot of discussion and the like. People saw how expensive their electricity bill had become because of the Russian aggression. The, the uh, cost of natural gas went through the roof. And so people found it actually worth their while putting photovoltaic panels on the roofs of their houses and businesses on the roofs of their business. It paid. It was actually cheaper than buying the, the electricity from the utilities. So that resulted in the one year without any major effort on the part of any major government, a 10% increase in photovoltaic installations in Europe. And do you think that people, citizens, have the power to change things? I think that citizens have to do a very important thing. See what's happening in the world and what is happening this past summer, what happened? a semi-tropical lush island in Hawaii burnt down. 
an island burnt down that's supposed to be this green paradise. A significant part of Canada, equivalent to the size of, I think it's Portugal or Greece, burnt down in many different parts of Canada. The island of Rhodes burnt down. Thousands of years people have been living there. When they know there hasn't been a fire like that before. Right in European history. We are in the global warming climate emergency. It's not next year. It's now. It has hit. When people on Maui were driving, there was a coastal road, a road like here, just along the Pacific Ocean, right there in the town there. And on one side is the road, just like there, and the other side is the ocean. And the fire was sweeping down from the mountains, and cars driving on that road were literally exploding. The cinders from the fire was hitting cars, and they were bursting into flames. People came to a screeching halt and jumped over the wall into the Pacific Ocean. The crisis of global warming is here. If you had been in Maui, you wouldn't have any doubt, okay, the game's up. This is not a slow energy transition with a lot to think about and we have to consider. To hell with that. Okay, so the ordinary citizen has to put the lives of their children and their grandchildren ahead of their aesthetic displeasure looking at aeolians, at wind turbines. They don't like the sight of them, and maybe they're right. Maybe they shouldn't like the sight of them. But the only thing that's going to keep their grandchildren alive is a massive transition into renewable energy right now so we get out of fossil fuels as fast as humanly possible. It can't be done by nuclear because it takes too long and costs too much. So the only th way it can be done is with aeolians and uh, you know, wind turbines and photovoltaic installations just built massively. So people have to put their, the lives of their children and their grandchildren ahead of their aesthetic considerations. And they're not doing that now. And in this situation, are you optimistic for the future? I would like to be. I think there's definitely a path to save the human race from extermination if people act. But if it's business as usual and people pretend that we are not in the climate crisis, that the cars were not blowing up on the road in Maui just next to the Pacific Ocean, then no, there's no chance. The robots that will succeed us, the artificial intelligence ro robots, will write, oh, they died, the human race died because it was so stupid. There's one more thing I wanted to say about obstacles, that these lobbies, in the United States, my country, the, the oil lobby is so powerful that it literally owns one of the political parties, the Republicans. It's not hard to see that. Ronald Reagan, Secretary of uh, the Treasury, was an oil man. Jim Baker, a very smart guy. He was a Texas oil man. He was a lawyer, but in the, oh, it dealt with oil matters. The next president was George Bush, the father, supposedly the smart one, the one who had the, the Kuwait war. That same guy was now Secretary of State, Jim Baker, asked why they're having the Kuwait war. He said the price of oil. It was interviewed, you can see it on TV. And George Bush, the father, the supposedly smart one, supposedly because that war was about as stupid as it was possible to be, he himself had an oil company, so he was in the oil business. Then his son, no one on planet Earth has ever described his son as an intelligent man. His son also had his oil company. That was the second Gulf War. Okay, then, he, so the two Bushes had 
oil companies. They were in the oil business. The last Republican president was, I hope the last one, was Trump. And who did he pick for foreign minister? For a secretary, it's called Secretary of State there. The CEO of Exxon, the world's biggest oil company, Rex Tillerson. So give me a break. That party should be renamed the oil party. That's the obstacle to getting out of uh, this catastrophic human race destroying product, which is fossil fuels. So I'm not very optimist, but... I'm Ye yes, I am, and here's why. Okay. The guy who succeeded him, Joe Biden, yeah. he passed a law which has a camouflage name the Inflation Reduction Act. It should be called the Renewable Energy Investment Act. But in the United States, it's very common that a law that laws have fake names to get them through Congress. It Same happens instance. constantly. <laughs> Same as here. OK. So what this law does is give but everybody at these conferences, I've, I've been the only one at these conferences that ever argued against carbon taxes. I said, no, that's not the way to go. What we should do is tax shelter, investment in renewable energy. We shouldn't punish, we should reward. It reward in a way that everybody jumps in. Look, there are probably people watching this who have a dog. The, and the dog doesn't want to go into the water. You, you, you push the dog into taking a bath or to a stream. And it, it acts you know, miserable and thinks you're really punishing it. Pick up a stone and throw it into the stream and watch the dog jump in after the stone. Same with the, a bathtub. The dog will jump into the bathtub. It rewards work better than punishment. And the Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, when we reward what we want rather than punish what we don't want, Biden's Inflation Reduction Act is already just causing just a ton of money to go into renewables. And because other countries are afraid that they will lose their industries, so they'll just all go to the United States, they're offering the same kinds or similar kinds of incentives, tax incentives. So the result is the thing that we need, which is a vast amount of money. We're talking about tens of trillions. I mean, this is World War size money that we're talking about. To finish, you do an interview with 100 leaders for the planet. Do you have a message for the leaders Leaders who can be uh, everybody, politicians, business leaders, but also uh, simple yes. citizens. The climate crisis is now. It's not someday in the future. It's right now. It's started. It's going to burn down your office if you don't act immediately on it. You have to institute a policy that will put vast amounts of money into infrastructure for renewable energy. Not subsidize people's electric bills. Build the wind turbines. Build the photovoltaic panels. Help them maybe with uh, heat pumps to instead of the traditional way of heating places. You have to do that and you have to do it in massive quantities and if don't push policies that simply pay off local lobbies that are more politically convenient pay off local lobbies but won't get us out of global warming the thing to do is get out of oil not continue in it that's number one the nuclear uh, program that France has is not a scam it's an honest program unquestionably an honest program, but it is, it 
too expensive to build the reactors and it takes too long to build them. So it will not solve the problem of the immediate crisis of global warming. Some of those reactors probably should be built. I don't know whether nine of them should be built. That's, a, that's all the money that there would be to do the other stuff. Thank you very much, Robert.